That was really good. I don't know Susan personally, but I think I might want to know her better after this. She, she's, she's got it about right, um, along with a lot of people yesterday as, as well. So you have to excuse me if I <coughs> cough a little bit. I haven't felt the best lately. Um, so my name is Russ Grease. Um, the way I like to start my presentations is with a short little prayer. So that's what I'm going to do. So just bear with me. Lord, I just want to say thank you for letting me be here and the amazing opportunity that I've had throughout my life to share what I'm going to share today and throughout all the time that I've been able to <coughs> present to people and hopefully they grasp this information, they understand it, let it resonate with them and let them share it. Amen. So, thank you for letting me do that. Um, my name is Russ Grease. RWGresearch.com is my website. Let's see if I can find the laser on this thing. Um, Open-source-energy.org is the forums at which we share our information. Uh, the RWG Research website is my personal space where I just publish the research, the stuff I'm doing, and then the discussion happens over here at uh, opensource-energy.org. So quantum gravity research is who I'm currently working for, and we do, um, our idea there is based on quasi-crystal math and understanding of the E8 lattice, and basically my position there is to do alternative energy research based on the theory that they're building, which includes consciousness and all sorts of really interesting things. It's all geometric based, so I encourage you to check that website out as well. Um, so you can download this slide from this website right here. Just go to rwgresearch.com and you can go to this direct link or you can just find events, Global BEM. It's not posted there yet, but I will have it there for anyone who wants to watch it uh, or go through these slides on their own. Um, so, Live Open Science, Global BEM, thank you guys, Global BEM, for letting me speak today. This was uh, an interesting turn of events. I wasn't even going to come because I could not, then a, a gentleman offered to get me here. I'm here now, and now I'm speaking. So, it, the world works in wonderful ways, and uh, I truly believe that. That's why the little prayer at the beginning is just a little push out there to, uh, to open up that, that flow path that, that I believe in. So. It's pretty incredible that I'm here today. So, what am I talking about? Um, understanding open source. So open source is something some people are scared of. They, 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 get, they, they hear open source and they freak out because some people, they think they completely lose all their rights or something like this when they publish something as open source. But that's not the case and hopefully I'm going to teach you a little bit of what I know. I am not uh, a person to stand up here and speak every word of this. I don't know all of the little details, but I know enough to share with you guys to dig deeper on your own, to understand that you, can, you don't have to be scared of the open source mentality. Uh, people think that, that, that if you just give away everything, it's just gone. You can't make money, you can't do anything, but that's completely wrong. You just have to understand it. So hopefully that's, that's what I'll get through today. So who am I? Uh, I'm just a guy doing something trying to make some progress and the world around us will allow that to happen if you step out there and do something good. So I research and report on new ideas as well as old ones. I try to prove what's real and what's not and do it in an open source mentality. So I don't only report but I, I have this people know me that I produce YouTube videos and that's how I do my research and, and people know me by watching those videos and they understand that I won't agree upon just somebody saying something, I have to literally do it myself. I have to build it and test it and that's the best method for me to, to, to show myself that yeah, this is, like, this is a realistic thing. So that's sort of the mentality I've always had uh, and one day I decided to just stop and, and, and be completely open source. I got frustrated with people trying to sell things and the, the, the back end and I, I got really frustrated with that and I decided the only way to make this work is, is complete open sourceness, which is one of the hardest things you can do is be completely open source. It's not an easy task to go around the world and not sign disclosure agreements and do things that most people do in business every day that you can't necessarily do in the open source mentality. So that's what I've been doing for about eight years now on, on my own terms and about two years with quantum gravity research. So 
this presentation isn't about all the projects I've done, but I've done tons of them. I'm an electrical mechanical person, that's my background, so I'm going to be presenting on completely the opposite thing, which is just the open source. So Stanley Meyer, most of you know who that guy is, the guy who ran the car on water. PAP, a noble gas engine, a little less known, um, but a really interesting thing. Cold fusion, or low energy nuclear reaction. In my case, I'm studying lattice assisted uh, fusion. So that's, that's sort of where I'm at with the quantum gravity research. Uh, magnet based systems, serial effect generator, just these basic principles and ideas that we all see that we don't know if it's real. I've, I've tried to grasp those myself. Vortex based math which I spent almost two years dedicated nonstop studying that at the beginning of my research time. And it is fascinating. I'm not a mathematician, I'm not really great at math, but that is so easy to understand and it's so interesting. So even if you're not a mathy guy, I encourage you to look at it. Edward Lee Skeldon, not too many people know about Ed, um, but he's got some interesting principles and ideas upon, upon the magnetic principles he works with, which is what I like about his work. 3D printing is something that I didn't really get into until late. Um, a gentleman by the name of Jeff actually sent me parts to build a 3D printer and I was scared of it. I was like, oh, this looks scary because you got to build it, program it, and understand it. And it's just like, it's, you have to focus on it. Now it's a little bit different. That was four, that was three and a half years ago. Um, so I finally started a year late. I built a different style 3D printer that looked a little more elegant to me and it was easier to build, although it was still just as, as challenging. And I got into 3D printing to the point where a lot of people subscribe to my YouTube channel because of the 3D printing. I do a bunch of stuff with that. I'm building my own 3D printer from basic bare bones nothingness right now just to, just to do it because it's a fun project for me. Um, and it's extremely helpful for building the garage. I'm a garage experimenter. I mean, my, I'm even in a garage now at my current facility. I feel just at home there. It's nice. So I come from the garage. I, I feel that most of the important stuff comes from the guy in his garage with a little idea and it just, he runs with it. So 3D printing is a way to accelerate that. I can literally think of something, draw it up in a simple drawing program import it, export it, slice it, print it. It's in my hand all within an hour. It, it's just like, you can do that. So 3D printing, if you guys don't know about it, I took it out of this presentation, but I got a tons of stuff on my website. You should, you should look into 3D printing if you're an inventor. Um, Voltzilla electric motorcycle actually was a project I did. I built an electric motorcycle. The idea was, can I build a working electric motorcycle with just stuff laying around? So what I did is I picked up a fork truck, I got one for free, I sold the battery, that got me some funds, I bought a motorcycle frame with that money, scrapped all the iron on the fork truck, built everything, found some used batteries, and ended up gaining $20 and having a working, functional electric motorcycle. Like, your resources are very powerful if you just look around and see what you can do with them. And I got tons of projects on my website, you can check them out. So. Open source, what is open source to me? This is my version of open source. Simply put, it's the free flowing and sharing of information. That's all it is. It's very simple. You would not be here today if someone didn't tell you about it. If they didn't share the information with you, you wouldn't be here. It's, I mean, it's just common sense. You don't share it, you don't know it. So why is open source important? These are the few things I picked out. Security, freedom, zero suppression, and zero loss of information. And what I mean here is, if you give it out to the world, and the world nowadays through the interwebs just spreads it like wildfire, it's forever out there. I have old videos and things I posted that sometimes I'm like, why did I do that? And why did I post it? But it's, it is out there, it's not coming back. And open source does that for you. It can be a bad thing if you're not careful, but it's definitely a sharing of information. It's very important. So open source generally refers to computer software. Most of you guys understand you can download free software. A lot of it is open source. That's where this, the, the mentality of open source kind of started. So what I want to focus on is open source hardware and open design. So the world of open hardware, it's not quite as developed as the um, software side of things, but the principles are the same. And so we use a lot of 
uh, we kind of take from the understanding and the people who learned along the way of, of how to do open source correctly with software and we apply it to a hardware. But there's definitely different standards there. So open source hardware, these are a few um, open source names that have been coined over time. Open source hardware, open design, open innovation, and collaboration innovation network. Say that three times fast. Okay, go ahead. That's it. Okay, good, you're awake. Okay, so open source hardware. Uh, open source hardware consists of physical artifacts, of technology designed and offered in the same manner as free and open source software. Examples of this are mechanical drawings, schematics, a bill of material, circuit board layouts, and fabrication techniques. These are all things you need to sort of include in your open sourcing of your hardware if you want to be successful in someone else replicating it. So open design, I'm just going to hit some key points of the original slide there. Open design is the development of physical production, of physical products, machines, and systems through the use of, uh, yeah, I lost my mind, use of plug, Publicity, yeah, my dad has the same problem. Spit it out, Russ. Shared design information, okay? Um, the process is generally facilitated through the internet and often performed uh, without monetary compensation. That's an important key. A lot of you here might be volunteers at some organization. Uh, the organization I work for is a nonprofit. Um, so these are, the, these, are, these are very basic things here. Open design is a form of co-creation where the final product is designed by the user rather than an external stakeholder such as a private company. Again, that's the, that's the thing Susan was talking about, about you know, somebody, you're, you're under control when you, you have to worry about the stakeholder in, in, in a private company. So people apply their skills and time on the projects for the common good, perhaps where funding or commercial interest is lacking, which happens a lot. Sometimes you have a really great idea and, and you have to find people of your like, such as you all who are here today, I'm sure, who can help you out because the big boys aren't, aren't concerned about you. They don't want to help you. Open design may provide a framework for developing advanced innovation, innovations and technologies that might be beyond the resource of any single person or company or country. Some methods of high-tech open source, um, oh, some methods use high-tech open source, but customized local solutions for sustainability development. So an example is 3D printing. If you're on the other side of the country, you don't have the resources. But if you can get a 3D printer, I can actually draw up a part here in the United States, print it out and inspect it and make sure it's gonna work, click a button, send it across the world and they can print it out right there and have the same part. That's, that's absolutely un unfathomable if you think about it. I'm taking a piece of physical hardware and I'm putting it in another country with 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 matter of hours because the printing takes a little bit of time so that's that's pretty cool so will open source speed up innovation some examples of how this can be accomplished oh it will some examples of how this will be accomplished is under the open innovation principle the idea behind open innovation is that in a world of widely distributed knowledge individuals or groups cannot afford to rely entirely on their own research but should instead adopt and use other open innovation, innovative ideas in other individuals or groups that have already developed it. This truly speeds up innovation. An example of this is when, um, while well, I'm drawing a blank, Mr. Mr. Tesla, who makes the Tesla cars. Um, okay, he, Elon Musk, I don't know why I lost my mind there. So Elon, as most of you should know, he actually gave away his patents. He open sourced his patents. He said, anybody can use my patents. Look at where he's at. Look at the company he's building and look what he did. That's, that tells you that you, you can totally be a businessman and be open sourced at the same time. That's a good example of this. Now he's got a bunch of patents, which we'll talk about in a minute, in, in a minute but he can do that. You can absolutely be open source and he can, anybody can build a car based on those patents. It's, it's, it's just really, it's impressive actually. I'm glad he did that. So models of innovation, idea competitions, okay? I, what an idea competition is, is it encourages completion of a project among contributors by rewarding the successful submission entries. So uh, XPRIZE does this, right? They say, here's a half a million dollars, just tell me how to clean up the oil. And they went through that process. They had a problem, 
they solved it through the, the idea of a competition. Um, right now, tomorrow's the last day for you guys watching live streams and you're going to enter the pulse motor competition. So I host what they call a pulse motor competition with volunteers that help me as well. And what it is, is if you don't know what a pulse motor is, it's, it's a very basic device that you just, it's a learning utensil, basically a, a basic pulse motor. Um, electromechanical device in this case. So what, what I do is I host a competition and I invite the world to come and say, hey, build a pulse motor, enter it in the competition, it's fun, you get to meet new people, and we accomplish a goal. And this is a learning tool for people. I encourage people to build the most basic things they possibly can because it, it encourages the guy that normally wouldn't get off their butt and just do something to just step up and try it. And if it's a big fail, it's okay. At least I got them motivated. So it's a, you know the idea competition principles is is a good one. So self organization networks. This is sort of like a self organization network right here. The most valuable and complex technologies are increasingly innovated by networks that self organize. If I want to build something and somebody comes along and has the same ideas, those two people get together and it, it starts to accelerate. And you get a bunch of people in a big network and things can just make huge progress. Me as an individual can't do a whole lot if I wanted to build an, an, a production thing. But if I had a business that had 100 people there, it's the same principle as that, but it's, it's self-organizing. People just sort of show up at your doorstep sometime, which happens a lot to me, and I'm thankful for that. So self-organizing networks are linked organizations that create acquire and integrate the drive the diverse knowledge and skills required to invent complex technologies if you're just one guy you have a great idea but the reason we're all here is because we each have our own opinion on it and our each have our own input on it that's why this works the idea leads the group to function without centralized detailed management which is an important key uh, that we talked about yesterday if, uh, if the technology is important, there will be self-organization groups to work on it. This, th th I've done projects where people just start showing up because I publish stuff on YouTube and I tell them I'm working on it and I tell them what I'm doing. And people just come and they start coming and they want to help. And it's, it, it's, it's a really interesting thing when you actually get to experience it. It's a powerful thing, actually. So we can see this in the energy problem we have right now. The people come together to solve the problem at hand. This is the entire reason most of us are here at this conference and watching online. All right, so we're going to talk about licenses. Again, I'm not a person that is a technical guy that can give you a bunch of detail on this. <clears throat> but what I want to do is just bring up these things so you understand them a little bit better than you do now, possibly. All right, so rather than creating new licenses, we just use the uh, same principles on the open source software licenses. So in general, there's two broad classes of open source licenses. Copy left. Anybody know what the other one is? Permissive. Good. That's not the best one. So, a copy left license sometimes refers to as a viral license. <clears throat> Those are which require derivatives to work. Uh, okay. Those are which require derivatives, derivative works to be released under the same license as the original. Copy left license include the G in U public license and the Creative Commons attribute share alike license. Uh, copy left license have been specifically designed for hardware. Oh, the ones that have. They include uh, CERN and TARP. So the licenses on the top here are the ones that are usually used for software. The ones on the bottom you see, those are actually designed for hardware. There's not as many of them, but they are being developed and they're it's a learning thing, but there are out there that you can use for your current work. So permissive licenses are those which allow proprietary closed derivatives. Okay, they include free BSD license, MIT license, and the Creative Commons attribute license. License that provide, uh, that license that prevent commercial use are not compatible with open source. In choosing a license, you should first decide whether, you, whether or not you want to bind people into making open source derivatives of your design, or if you, want to, uh, open, if, if you do want open source derivatives, pick a copy left license. If you do not, choose a permissive license. 
In short, copyleft license uh, does allow others to use your information and build upon it. Then they must release it under the same license. The example here is 3D printing. So if I grab a, a, a printer that's open source or a piece of hardware that's open source and I replicate it, I can absolutely produce that product and sell it or whatever I want to do as long as I, as long as I abide to this license, which is, which, is, which is great. A permissive license does not allow users to build on it and release the information. It only allows the user to use the information freely. So for instance, if you wanted to, if you wanted to make something and you wanted other people to build on it and help you contribute and, and be okay with letting them pursue it further and actually use it as their own, then that's what you want to do as a copy left. So permissive license, you can still share it freely, but they're not allowed to commercialize it, basically. So if you want to protect yourself, but you want to give it out to the world for the guys in their garage, like me, who can actually build it, that's, that's a good one. All right, so what other best practices for open source hardware? What are they best practices? Make it clear. Make it clear how, you, how your hardware is licensed by providing a copy of or at least a web link to the license with your hardware. If you just say this is a license and you don't link it, uh, some people, they won't pay attention to it at all. Be clear about what parts of the hardware are open source and which are not. You can do that. Uh, put the logo on there, the open source hardware logo. This, you can find this logo on the internet. Uh, you can download it for free, you can put it, literally, you can etch it onto your boards or your hardware or whatever you want to do and it's, bam, it's open source. It just throws it in your face, which is nice. Uh, keep your source files in a free, public, available source code repository like GitHub. This makes it easier for people to track uh, their changes to your files. It also makes it easier for them to send improvements back to you. The tools for this kind of data exchange are still uh, pretty weak for the hardware projects, but the software is uh, software's pretty good. So th again, the hardware side of this is still being developed, the open source hardware. So some of these things aren't developed along nicely, and it's just one of those things, excuse me, that has to be a trial and error thing where they have to set up a repository. It's one thing to just throw some code on the internet, it's a whole other thing to throw a piece of hardware on the internet. Like how do you do that? You have to do that through schematics and design. That's a lot of, it can be a lot of work. But if you're designing the project, you should have it. You just have to compile it, put it in a place where people can find it. And the most important part about this is if, one, if people want to help you and you don't publish your information out there in a, in a nice way, it, it's completely useless. I've produced projects where I've just thrown it up there on, an, on a video, literally, and it's like the best thing ever. And nobody can reproduce it because they don't have the time to sit there and go back and understand everything I say through that video. But if you produce it in a document form where you can download it, you can read through it, you can skip around, you can do what you want, that's the best way to do it. Uh, I usually combine the two if I can. I'll make it downloadable and here, and then I'll also make a video on it. So, because I learn by, by viewing, okay? I learn by looking at pictures and watching videos. Other people completely don't get it. They have to read through it. So I found the best way to do it is to do both of these things. All right, what are the concerns with open source? There is nothing that protects you from someone else trying to patent your open source hardware other than if it's labeled prior art. Uh, first to file does not deny the existence of prior art. Many members of the community publish their work on blogs and websites, like I do. Prior art must be made public, but there's no guarantee that the patent office will find your work. They're not going to go around searching random websites for prior art. In a perfect world, the patent office would not be able to award you if the patent, uh, if the information was published as prior art publicly. The only way, this is, uh, may not be the only, this is the way I found out, to get your ID into, into the public domain and make it prior art is to file a defense publication. Now, when I was doing research on this, I had no idea what that was. I, I didn't even know there was such a thing. And this is key to making sure the patent office people who check those things, if it's prior art, it's key to making sure they see it. So what is a, uh, what is a defensive publication? Defense publication. Defense publication, uh, which are endorsed by the US Patent and Trademark Office as an, ex as an intellectual property rights management tool. 
They are documents that provide descriptions and artwork of the product, device, method, or that it enters, oh, so that it enters the public domain and becomes prior art. This powerful disclosure prevents other parties from obtaining patents on the product, device, or method. It enables the original inventor to ensure that they have access to their invention by preventing others from later making patent claims on it. It also means that they do not have to shoulder the cost of a patent application. Me, as a garage inventor, do not, I don't have any funds. Like, if I want to just do something, I have to save up or like sell something or something along those lines. So to file a patent application as an inventor like myself is almost completely impractical. I just literally would never be able to, uh, to, to bring the funds into it. And this allows you to do that without having to spend any cost. All right, so defense publications. This enables a non-attorneys to use a set of web-based forms to generate the defensive publication. The, complex, uh, the completed defense publication will be added to the IP.com database, which in turn uses, is, is used by the intellectual property attorneys in the patent and trademark office to search for prior art when examining the patent application. That's key. I publish all of my work on the internet. Once it's out there, it's out there. I don't even license some of it or put any, anything on it. I just publish it because it's fine with me. Um, it, it, I can, it's, almost, it's, it's almost known that a patent attorney is not going to go on the internet and do some deep searches on especially the stuff we're working on in this room. So this is like, it goes directly to their database, which is fantastic. And the open source community is actually the one, the software guys actually develop these defensive publications. Anyone can actually file one of these at this website right here, defensepublications.org. Uh, this is a quote from their website. We are asking the open source community to publish the key innovative concepts in order to prevent patents from being granted by others later for the same ideas. It's common sense, but uh, also another quote. These innovative concepts do not have to fully uh, be fully implemented and demonstrated to work. When you get a patent, from my understanding, you have to have like a demonstration unit or you have to prove that it's a functioning thing. Um, you don't have to do that here. If you, if you dreamed up this random idea and you woke up the next day and you wrote it down and you put it in a defense publication, even if it's just completely way out there, according to their website, they're stating that is okay. That's, that's pretty impressive. That, that throws it into prior art and it doesn't allow people to patent it. Even if, it, even if it's something that may not even work. So defense publications are extremely important to keep the information free, uh, freely flowing. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? One minute. Really? Okay. So this, um, I'm going to give you two examples. Open source hardware success stories. I got a lot of information on these. You have to download these slides to, uh, to read them all. So Arduino, Arduino is an open source physical computing platform based on a simple microcontroller board and developed uh, and a development environment for writing software for the board. So they have software and they have hardware and it's completely open source and they're the biggest company that sells hardware like this, from my understanding in the whole world for this type of processor. Very successful, completely open source. It can be done, you just have to know how to do it. I have a background on their success story here, but we don't have time. You can read later. Open source hardware success stories more. RipRap 3D printers. Now, the interesting thing about these 3D printers is that, um, okay, I'm going to read one, one slide here. Uh, in the presence of blocking patents, did not discourage the do-it-yourselfers from creating innovative new ideas, technologies on top of the core open source machine blueprints. So what happened is, this thing was patent. The 3D printer technology why, is why you haven't seen it, is because it was patent. That patent expired, and the guys that were doing this in the garage are still very, very successful as a business, as a company. Um, MakerBot, a few of the other ones, those were the guys in the garage just doing this, even though it was patent. And when it, in, in this case, when it expired, huge business broke out, but it's still completely open source, which is it, it's, it just shows you, you can do that. So my conclusions here. One can successfully create a business based on open source by taking the correct steps to do so. Knowledge is power. You've heard it. 
Open source, uh oh, broke it. Aw, boo. Do I want to send it? No. Hold on. I'll bring it back up. Almost there. Wait, go down first before you do it. Now I gotta go through all the slides. Oh, it's so fancy. I don't have a Mac. I have a PC. Okay. I'm a PC guy, I'm sorry. I do love my iPhone, but I got, I got in trouble by the open source community. They said, Russ, you carry around an iPhone and you're an open source guy, what's wrong with you? So I got an Android. I don't really like it. Apple does a good job, what can I say? I know. Okay, conclusions. All right, so open source has proven itself to be one of the best ways to innovate and spread a product methodology to the people. Security, freedom, zero suppression, loss of information. Uh, how much time do I have? Like one minute? Yeah, that was three minutes ago. Uh, okay, so live open science, I'm gonna skip this part, but basically I stream live on the internet and I do this because people can come and they can watch what's happening and they can actually see me work live in the lab and they can feedback by texting to me and they can see when I do something wrong or they can help me through a problem. This is like the best mentality of open source you can do is on the fly. I love it, it's absolutely amazing. If you go to rwgresearch.com forward slash live, you can watch me work live at my current lab. So check that out. Uh, how can you help? Um, I'll skip through these. Okay, use your resources. Ego and greed. This is the worst one. It's, it, I mean, I learned along the way of being greedy and ego that it just doesn't work. I learned that early on and I was lucky to learn that. Okay, let it go. Just make a difference and be humble about it. I know you want your credibility. Sometimes you just have to let it go. It's okay. You, you'll be happier you did that anyway. So, running out of time. As much time as you need. Okay. As long as it's one minute. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> let me reset the timer. Okay, so I'm the kind of person that gives, pays it forward, does that type of mentality. I've learned through my, my faith background, which I'm a Christian, I learned through my faith background that giving and receiving works in immaculate ways, okay? So I just always like to tell people, stick your foot out there and throw some money at somebody that needs some help, especially on these energy projects. Like, just, just do it. Because in return, you'll get something back. It won't be what you expected. It won't work how you want. But you'll get a kick in the butt in a positive way somehow. That's why I'm here today. Literally, this has happened to me. I've done something and it just comes full circle. And it's, it may take 10 years, but it, it, it does happen. So briefly, what have I accomplished? Uh, this is the PAP Noble Gas engine that I worked on. I did not build this engine, this is the original. This is the popper device which I've tested, built and constructed myself through the open source community, as well as fundraising that way a little bit. Um, Stanley Meyer stuff, I've been working on it since the beginning of my research, it's where I started. Uh, I got a heart for it and I haven't worked on it too much lately but it's, there's so much there to go through and build and these, these are all things that I've actually built. This is Stan's original EPG and this is the one I built. So Pulsefire is a piece of software that nobody ever uses and William Klanzenar, he built this thing and it's, it does so much stuff and nobody uses it. And it's a, it runs off the Arduino, it does logging and pulsing. And it's, it's an incredible piece of software, so I always throw it up and give him credibility. He's worked countless hours on it. There's the electric motorcycle. Yes, you understand why it's called Voltzilla. It looks like a piece of trash. <laughs> but it freaking works. And I got 20 bucks when I was done. By the way, that took me three months to build. That was outside of work hours, of course. Uh, Vortex-based math. Uh, these are my coils that I've built. Uh, there's many, many, many more. If you look these up on my website, right now they're broken, so I'm gonna try to fix those links, but here's some pictures. That is actually a quarter inch diameter from end to end. And the wire is number 45, smaller than your hair. Uh, the Rostock printer, this is my actual 3D printer that I've built from scratch, the first one I ever built, still using it. Building a brand new one. If you subscribe to my YouTube channel, you can watch me build it. I'm still not halfway through that thing. 
Um, the filament extruder to go with the 3D printer, this is a completely built from trash. Like literally everything you see on here is either 3D printed or came out of a dumpster. Um, and what this does is it produces filament so that I can use it for my 3D printer. So I can literally take this cup after I'm done, shred it, put it in here, and make a new cup. I don't have to wash it that way. <laughs> I know it's hard to do dishes this way with ceramic, but I'm working on it. Um, so there's another picture of it. This is all just stuff I've engineered myself and threw together. Um, so overview, open source is a way of innovation, information will uh, change the world as we know it. Protect yourself, okay, this open source will protect yourself, your ideas, by filing your work to a defensive publication <coughs> website. The big guys can't stop you from your own inventions. That's terrible. If you patent something and they think it's too good to have sold, they can just take it from you. What good is a patent in that, in that particular circumstance? Open source can still be uh, well, open source can still be profitable ah, and keep knowledge and innovation progressing. It, it bothers me that people think you can't make a profit on open sourcing, but you absolutely can. You can be a businessman and do open source. Open source is the way to keep people in control and not Big Brother. It's been presented all weekend here. It's, it's, there's some really great information here. Open source is the key to secure one's self-being. If you're not only the one, if you're not the only one hold, this is the big one. If you're not the only one holding the key, then there's no reason to be concerned about the knowledge. But people like ask me all the time, "Hey Russ, aren't you afraid about sharing an idea or keeping an idea?" I just get it out there. I don't have to worry about the men in black or whoever you want to worry about. I don't have to worry about it because I'm not the only guy holding the key. Okay, that's an important piece of why I walk around the world going, eh, not concerned. I'm just not concerned. People always ask me if I'm concerned. It's like, no. Look at the mentality I have, understand what I'm thinking, and you'll understand why I think that way. Okay, almost done. Think freely, do freely, be helped by others, encourage others, and make serious progress with open source. Don't pay it back. Pay it forward. It's okay to give back to your mom and dad. Sometimes you gotta give to your kids. Just pay it forward, okay? The guy in front of you in line, pay it forward. You will get something back. You'll never expect it. Not just a hat rack, my friend. I 3D printed this and I hung my hats in the closet. Can you tell which one's my favorite? No, it's the one on the top left. That's actually my wife's. All right, I'm going to leave this up here. You guys can see some quotes that I have say every time. Thank you for letting me be here. BEM, rock on, guys. Thank you for putting on this presentation, this conference, and just sharing the information. I, I firmly feel that if we follow the principles outlined by Russ here, we're going to see a logarithmic curve in the growth of energy and consciousness and healing technologies. So I encourage everybody to do that. And, uh, oh, hello. Hello. The presentation yesterday morning, um, uh, Mike Upstone, that was, that was, if you follow those principles, I basically just hit one keynote here of his entire presentation. So I highly recommend looking at what he said because he hit all of the points. So fair game.